Hey, this is Pamela. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and let's get into this review. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Pamela, and you are watching Pam Entertainment TV, where we review movies, television series, and incidents in pop culture just to see how those incidents affect our daily lives. Listen, we are getting ready to review Atlanta, episode six, entitled White Fashion. So the episode starts off, we, we're in this fashion house with this fashion designer. I think his name was Marcello, Marcello, something like that. And they're getting ready. They put, rolled out this campaign. Uh, the CEO was there. Everything was cool and copacetic. They rolled it out. He tells them the inspiration of his campaign. The CEO wants a copy of, uh, he wants a, a a jacket or a piece from that campaign to give to his son. Um, and as it pans off from them, we see the campaign and it says Central Park 5. And on the poster, you see a white lady in the middle like they're having a picnic. And then there's five black men almost half naked around her. So then it pans back to Paperboy and Earn. They're in a meeting with this um, uh, designer. So apparently he didn't realize or he claims he didn't realize that Central Park 5 and him doing that campaign was a reflection of the case that happened back in the 90s where the five black boys were um, uh, uh, accused of, of beating and raping a Central Park jogger. And then come to find out that the DNA shows that none of them d did it. But, you know, that whole case, Central Park 5, there is a show, I think it's either on HBO or Showtime, that you can watch that. We're going to carry on. So what they've done is that they decided to get some a popular black uh, artist or a popular black somebody to come in and then to... Uh, showcase that they're not racist, that they, you know, they made a mistake, they don't have a racist bone in their body, and that they, <laughs> the company is going to um, do or donate money or do whatever to a certain uh, social justice cause. So we, uh, Earn talks to Paperboy about it because Paperboy goes into the meeting and he wants free clothes and free this and free that. And Earn was telling him, look, it's all right to get free clothes and stuff like that, but you need to, there needs to be some type of benefit for black people. They're using you just to, to appease black folks. And Paperboy's like, man, I don't want to hear all that mess. And so then he's, you know, he's invited to go to this meeting. He's dressed in a cute little suit. He's looking through the door and he sees this woman who's singing. She's in a wheelchair. She's a black lady in a wheelchair. So bam, you checked off. A uh, uh, black woman and you've checked off uh, uh, the disabled list. Then you have the black man and he appears to be a gay black man. Boom. You checked off the black folks and the gay black folks. Then you had this other person. He looked racially ambiguous or biracial. So bam, you check that check off. And then you had one lady in there. She looks like she was of Asian descent. And so basically the black guy uh, the gay black guy, I can't think of what his name is right now, but he was basically telling Earn that he's just running a scam. He's been doing this quote unquote social justice warrior, uh, 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 stick for a very long time. He goes to different companies. He offers his, uh, services to be able to get, to get back in the graces of the black community. But basically he's just in doc ingratiating his, um, pockets because he is the the charity he is the black person that they're going to be uh getting the war and companies don't care they just want to be able to say that they've done something they don't care who they've done it with and why they've done it with and this is probably a uh pretty much a spinoff on what's been going on right now with the black Ma black lives matter group uh with them collecting a whole lot of money off the term that they trademark black lives matter but you haven't seen sufficient uh, evidence of what they what actually they've done within the community uh and so paperboy is having to come to a realization that uh all of these people the black people the white people and all those people are just basically playing at the you know they're just 
doing just enough so that their name can be uh covered as far as oh see we're working with we're working with organizations to try to uh show that they are not racist but there's but they still are um so i'm gonna end up his little storyline with he comes up with these great ideas to do uh the the gay black uh character uh, he says, well, we can do it under my charity. Paperboy does it under his charity. He advises uh, Paperboy to do a, a pitch a program to Marcello. He does it, and then Marcello takes it and takes it in All Lives Matters, the whole campaign. And he has everybody, he, he changes the whole focus of Paperboy's um, uh, thought process. And so Paperboy is upset, but the gay black guy tells him, look... You need to have your own charity so that you can, you can do what you want to do in your own charity. But he didn't tell him that before, but he kind of give him the little heads up behind that. And then they, they, they end that with him taking him to uh, the Black Panther um, uh, premiere. And it's funny because I think this is the second time in this show that they talked about going to the Black Panther premiere. I guess they thought it was going to be up and running by this time, but it's not. So then let's go with Darius. Uh, Darius, uh, they asked Darius, uh, remember I talked about the meeting with Marcello. I think that's what his name is. And they asked him what he wanted to eat. And he said he wanted some jollof rice. And that's a Nigerian and Ghanaian. So if you're in West Africa, from West Africa, you know about jollof rice. So he, there is a spot across town that he wants to go to get jollof rice. So he takes the... Um, I guess she, um, I can't remember what she says she does, but it's her job to make sure that the talent is okay. So she goes, he, she, he takes her across town to eat the jollof rice. They meet the lady named Mimi. Um, I guess, I, I did not know, but I guess um, Darius, somebody in Darius' family is from Nigeria. He's speaking to Mimi. She understands what he's doing. And he orders what he orders. So the white lady is just in there like, oh, I have never had this food. What is this? I, you know, I, what is that? You know, just asking all this question. And Darius, you know, tells her all that information. Uh, the next thing you know, next couple of days or whatever, she goes and she buys Mimi out. And she takes over the, uh restaurant well she takes she closes the restaurant down and then she has a truck and so Darius is looking around like oh my god I don't even understand what's going on I'm gonna tell you what's going on y'all be so busy to try to share everything with white people and you understand and and and, and I'm sorry to any of my white fans I do not mean offense I am just telling what we know when we share things with you all in the in the in the guise of sharing you decide that you're going to take it, whitewash it, and then make a whole lot of money off of what we've done. And so that's basically what has happened. And she's over with a food truck. She's probably talked to all her white friends. Oh, you all need to eat this jollof rice. And it probably doesn't even taste the same. It reminds me of how curry and um, um, things like that, because you know that curry is the main dish for those people in Brit for, for for the people of Britain. England but curry is I think is an Indian dish but they but I guess with the spices and everything they enjoy it uh and anyway we won't go any we won't go any deep but that's basically what happened with Darius so then we do with Ern. Ern is in a hotel. He's had a meeting. He goes to the concierge because he wants to know if there's an Apple store because he has dinged his Apple watch and while the concierge is trying to find the Apple store he sees Van. Van uh, sashays in like uh, ain't nothing going on, and she sits down at the uh, at the you know at the restaurant in the hotel. So Ern goes over to her and asks her, "Hey, what you doing? Where you been? I mean, you, we've been gone for weeks." And she just looks at him. She says, "Oh, I'm doing fine. How you doing?" And he's like, "Where you been?" He says, "I called your mama, and she didn't know where she where you been." And she was looking at him like. Look, you all are working. You all are busy. I'm handling my business. Don't worry about me. I'm doing fine. And I'm looking like, all right, Van. I mean, because she looked like she was doing she was doing okay. But I was concerned. I was like, well, I don't blame Ern. He doesn't know where she's at. He said, you know, we're parents. You can't go missing. 
I need to know where you are. I'm not, you know, and, and to me, that's just fair. It's not like anybody is going to take over where, what you're doing, but check in. Nobody should, you know, you're in a foreign country. You have a child. You both have a child. If something happens to you, nobody knows anything happened. And how he going? How is he going to explain to you all's child that the mama she went to she went overseas? I invited her over, but she's gone. But anyway, while they're sitting at the hotel uh, lob, I mean at the restaurant at the hotel, here comes a, a, a Karen comes in and Ted says, "I was just at this store." And I followed you here because you stole that wig. And she was like, no, I purchased that wig. So then the Karen decides that she is going to grab hold of Van and hold her. Now, Van is a good one because I think at that moment I would have just slapped her. Because, you know, people think I, I would have slapped her. I just would have slapped her. But uh, Ern says, hey, you need to let her go. The concierge comes. And so... Uh, Ern cooks up this story like, look, I just was looking for my, y'all done lost my bags. You can't find my reservation. And I am in need, you know, we just in here and now she's accusing us of stealing. So the concierge and the security take the white lady out and they give Ern a, a, a free room for the night. Now, Ern's not even staying at that hotel, just scamming. So <laughs> he goes back and he asks Van just straight up, did you steal it? Child, next thing you know, Van is kissing, kissing and hugging and doing all what she doing. Child, they got a free room. They get up there and do the whoop de whoop. Ern gets up the next morning because he hears the phone ringing because basically they they the, it's the hotel saying, hey, you got this free room. Now we're going to need, I guess, to get their credit card information or do whatever so they can pay for the room. And so he's hung up on them like two or three times. So uh, that's the end of that. And that is pretty much the episode in a nutshell. Uh, what I thought about that episode, I, I, I enjoyed the episode. They highlighted things that are going on in our community. Uh, the first thing is companies coming out and doing, doing and saying racist stuff and then turning around and wanting to apologize to the community. That's one thing. And then the other component of it is that we have these quote unquote social justice warriors who say they are working for the community, but they're actually working for themselves in the guise that they're working for the community. And that hints on, like I said earlier, with uh, Black Lives Matter and all of these other places, they're doing things to uh, uh, fill their coffers and do the things that they want to do, but they're really not t working with the people in a whole. Then you have the 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 incidents of between Earn and Van about the lack of communication and the importance of communication and this thing with her and the Karen, uh, just basically how white white folks think that they are always need to police you for whatever reason, wherever you go, whatever you do, they feel like they have the right to police you. Uh, and then you, you have Ern um, scamming the folks out of a room. And then with Darius, now this is the one that gets me because this is the one that I think uh, as as black folks, we have to be for wherever you lie in the diaspora. You have, we have to gatekeep the things that belong to us or are associated with us. Because Darius and his need to be, to educate the white people on the black folk, he's messed around and he has actually put some black folks out of business. You know, him trying to be, you know, educate somebody about the foods and educate the people about all of this other stuff. Then you turn around and you have these people that will then turn around and take what you have, whitewash it and sell it, sell it to the people when you should be selling this stuff. So that's the one that I have an issue with a lot of that. And I see it all online. I see it on TikTok. I see it on Instagram. Um, and particularly now with... Um, AAAV, African-American vernacular, English, you know, all of a sudden now everybody wants to speak, you know, I, well, let me just break it down real clear. Back in the 80s and into the 90s, when it used to be called Ebonics, nobody wanted to touch it. Everybody was like, oh, no, that's just broken English. You can't speak that. But when you go to any other country that has been colonized, uh, there's always a form of English by the immigrant population. 
uh, that has been used and, 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 and spoken. But here in America, us black folks, we have, we have this big issue about certain things. We want it to be, I don't know what it is, but a lot of us speak that way. We all have, regardless of whether or not that you speak English with, uh, uh, with perfect diction and using and, and subject verb agreement, but a lot of us have different slangs, different things that we understand within our community. And so now what's happening on TikTok, you have a lot of these young people that think that, that oh, that's just the way Americans speak. No, that's the way a lot of black Americans speak. And you all are, uh, you know, are culturally appropriating the speak, culturally appropriating the things and trying to make it seem like it's the whole, uh, the whole United States does that. And you don't. And it's different throughout the country because the people in the South speak AAVE one way. People in the North speak it a different way. People out West speak it a different way. So it's, it's, and you know, it's still the same, but there's just different things that because of where you are, that makes it different. Everybody understands, well, I don't know about understanding, but everybody knows that the people in the South speak it one way. And, so, but anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent. I'm going off on a tangent. Uh, what did you all think of this episode? I, I like this episode. I like that it highlighted a lot of the social, uh, uh, the show, social ills that we face in this country, particularly how corporations um, monetize off of uh, racism and, and black trauma. It talks about how black folks understanding that, that the companies, certain black people understand that companies are trying to, I'm putting, in, I'm doing air quotes, to atone for uh, their racism or profiting off of um, black trauma. There are some black folks and they, in, in the guise of being social justice warriors who are taking the money for the co corporations and profiting for themselves. And it's not a, 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 a it doesn't benefit uh, most or even some of the, of the black folks. It just benefits that one particular person. And then we have the cultural appropriation uh, to the point where you put uh, minority businesses out of uh, out of business and you culturally appropriate uh, the culture. And that has a lot to do with a lot of us within the culture sharing so much of our culture with somebody else. And then they take their balls balls and run with it. They either put you out of business and they take your business. I know that this has happened in the music business. Uh, if you go back 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, you have black folks doing a lot of different types of music. In the 50s through the 70s, a lot of that music that black folks did, a lot of white folks didn't want the black folks singing to their children about it. So they will find a white artist to sing the exact song to their kids. And then when you come up later in the years, you're thinking that that white artist is the artist that started that music. And it's not. It's the black artist that did that. Uh, that has happened. And also you can see it now in rap music. When rap music and hip hop music first started, there was a lot of social uh, uh, awareness, but it was always a lot of fun and a lot of things. When gangster rap happened, there are black folks that are doing it, but behind those black folks were white people pushing that, uh, that message and it has degenerated now into what we hear now. So there is not that much variety in, in, in hip hop as it used to be back in the 80s, the 90s, and even in the 2000s. There was a whole variety of hip hop music. Now it's just, uh, what is it? Trap music, drill music, uh, uh, still some gangster rap in there, all mixed up in one. And there's a lot of white faces in the background pushing that music and any type of mu uh, hip hop that talks about social consciousness, or, or people rapping about things other than being a whore, uh, sexing this man real good, uh, shooting up the club, having sex with so many women, all of the stuff that's degener degenerate, if it's not talking about stuff like that, it doesn't get no airplay. But anyway, 
I enjoyed this episode. So y'all let me know in the comments what you thought about this episode. Sorry, didn't so show my face. I just was not feeling well to do that. But I did want to get this episode out to you all. So uh, have a good, good rest of your evening. And as always, people, bye-bye.